why don't you begin by having a quick overview of the uh, current state of uh, global economy with a special reference to the US economy. As you know very well, the World Bank uh, very recently uh, put out a, a, its global economic outlook reform report uh, with a stern warning that there is a possibility of uh, stagflation in fact, uh, the U.S. has been experiencing uh, very rapid uh, inflation. What is your assessment uh, of the current? Well, first, thank you very much for the invitation to be with you and to be <clears throat> with your audience. As, as you suggested, I think we're in treacherous economic waters. Um, if, you, if you look at the core points in the World Bank Economic Outlook Report. You, you first have supply side shocks and high inflation after a protracted period of, of uh, monetary expansion, which we know quite well. But also, particularly in the US, we've had very strong fiscal expansion. And all this is in the overall context of a debt buildup. And so that would suggest, and certainly the Federal Reserve is moving in this direction, that we're in for an era of higher rates. And given the debt in developing countries, the World Bank was trying to signal the particular dangers for emerging markets. Now, to give your audience a, a fuller sense of the U.S. situation, I think there's a challenging combination the Federal Reserve is trying to work through. First, there's very strong demand. And at least in my view, the government stimulus last year was, was too large. So we had a, uh, a strong fiscal response. Then you've also got the supply side uh, constraints and shocks. And, and as the Federal Reserve has pretty much admitted, they misjudged the situation and now they're trying to catch up. And as you know, that's always a challenging position for central banks to be in. Despite the higher inflation, spending in the US still looks resilient. Um, there are capacity constraint, constraints, and that will take either time to fix them or adjust it in a downturn. The labor market conditions remain tight. And so I think uh, the stress, as in developing countries, will be most on the lower income. When you talk to the bankers in the United States, the middle class has, has some cash buildups, which they're still sort of working through. So I think one of the challenges is even though you've got inflation and they're trying to create constraints, you still have the demand. So I suspect we'll see some short-term decline in inflation, um, but because frankly, as you look at the 12 months period, some of that's built in. But then I think over the course of the, this year and next year, you have to expect either more tightening or more inflation. Um, and as you know, from your experience, the challenge is monetary policy has to be anticipatory. Um, and so, you're, in the sense, I think we still are going to have to face the fact that there's going to have to be some, uh, some slack to reduce the inflation that's already built into the system. And so it gives me no comfort to say, but I think the most likely scenarios that I would see are either stagflation or uh, even possibly a recession. Now, to bring this back globally, of course, the, the forces of deglobalization and supply shocks will add friction. And to bring it back to the developing countries, if you take the Fed tightening, the, the enormous strain for some countries because of the food problems coming out of Russia, Ukraine, the absence of cooperation, interdependence hasn't, hasn't been lost. We've just sort of added costs and frictions, um, and we still have the spillovers in the system. So I think for Korea and for all the economies, it's going to be heavy weather economically. Yes. Uh, you just briefly mentioned the Russian war in Ukraine. In fact, uh, uh, that also exacerbated the already existing inflationary uh, trend. The war in uh, uh, Ukraine uh, now is uh, exhibiting uh, very serious and significant impact on the uh, existing global economic order and the security order and uh, geopolitical implications and so forth. So 
uh, since uh, our main interest is in this uh, area of world order and uh, geopolitics, uh, could you share your insights uh, with regard to this uh, Ukraine, uh, Russian invasion to Ukraine? So for your audience, I think it's important to start with the most basic point, which is the mindset of President Putin in Russia. Yeah. Um, and he's explained a lot of this in his own writings. Um, he's very focused on Russian history and his place in Russian history. And he believes that Ukraine has, was never an independent part of Russia. And after his action in 2014, where he invaded Crimea and some of Eastern Ukraine, he had hoped, I think, that that shock would pull Ukraine towards Russia, but it had the actual opposite effect. It, Ukraine was being pulled west. He spoke to Bill Burns, who's the CIA director, a former colleague, a friend of mine, at the end of last year. And Putin said something to Burns that I found very telling. He said, what choice do I have? Now, of course, he has many choices, but what that gives you a sense of the mindset that Putin felt at age 69, Ukraine being pulled west, um, that he had to act. And I think this also means he had a growing appetite for risk. I think his intelligence about what would happen in Ukraine was poor. Um, and he's made a big miscalculation. As we saw, the Ukrainian defense was quite stalwart. But what I think it also means for all of us is I wouldn't expect Putin to retreat easily. In fact, I would expect the opposite. I think that he will be doubling down. So what are the possible outcomes? Well, one might be a rump state. That would be Putin's hope where he could squeeze it. Uh, another would be a stalemate. And this is one that Korea is very familiar with. Then there's the possibility of settlement. Um, I think uh, President Zelensky at Ukraine has sort of signaled what he might like to try to achieve here, but he's got his own public opinion to deal with. And he said that any settlement would have to go to referendum. Then there are the broader issues. For example, we've seen the interest of Finland and Sweden sort of joining uh, a NATO. Another issue that, you, that uh, Korea has been an important part of is the sanctions regime. And I think the biggest surprise in this area was the effectiveness of uh, the controls of the Russian reserves. And there are about $300 billion of reserves, whether they're held in dollar or euro or, or pounds or yen or others. And those have basically been, been blocked. And then we have the food and energy prices that we alluded to. So I was at the World Bank, as you will recall, you were working on these issues for Korea for the 2010 summit. We had, at the time of the global financial crisis, a huge food price crisis. Right. And there were about 50 countries that suffered riots or major upheavals. And I think we're at risk of that again. So then there's, a, I think, two other big geopolitical questions here. One is China. Um, you know, China, uh, uh, Xi Jinping and uh, Putin had, I think, about 38 meetings. Xi referred to a no limits partnership with Russia, um, but he's being careful. He doesn't want to risk sanctions being opposed to China. So you see the state oil companies and the banks are keeping some distance uh, from, from uh, China. He doesn't want Putin to lose, but he also doesn't want to get drawn into the morass. And I think the other part that for Korea and the United States to keep in mind is while there's been an, an impressive coalition of which Korea has been an important part, um, one also sees there are a number of countries that are uncertain. I call them the abstainers from some of the UN mm -hmm. votes. So if you look across Africa, Latin America, Asia, and others, and frankly, this is an important part of your question on economics, they've got other concerns. They're worried about food prices, energy, sanctions, COVID, and uh, the United States and Europe and, and others in Asia are going to have to pay attention to some of those concerns. Since you mentioned uh, China, uh, maybe we turn to um, the intensifying uh, U.S.-China rivalry and competition and its impact on the, uh, the existing post-World War II liberal economic order China, uh, unlike uh, earlier decades, now 
uh, does not want to hide his uh, ambition to become a hegemonic power, perhaps by 2050. And uh, our U.S. policymakers, uh, uh, particularly the Biden administrations, uh, is uh, unlike uh, Obama administration, uh, which had the rhetoric of uh, Fibit to Asia. But the uh, Biden administration at least uh, initiated uh, what you call IPEP, Indo-Pacific Economic Forum, and the Quad, and the AUKUS, and, and, and so forth. Uh, which all served uh, to counter the Chinese uh, security and economic dominance. But the thing is that the IPAP is fine and the Korea uh, decided to uh, join as well. But the IPAP does not have uh, the uh, access provisions for access to US markets. So people are wondering how much it can do uh, in increasing the U.S. economic uh, influence in the region. Uh, so I mentioned all this and to get your regions and the, your insights in this regard. So I think um, coming to the Biden administration, the good side is they recognize the need to repair important alliance ties, uh, including uh, with Korea. Um, I recall during the Trump administration writing and pushing to make sure that we could keep the U.S.-Korean free trade agreement, which is an important dimension, and also recognizing the security ties. And as you said, Biden, I think, has done a good job by building on that with the AUKUS arrangement, which is more than submarines. That's looking towards future technology arrangements. Uh, the Quad, which involves India, as you know, this, that isn't an alliance. India will always want to act with strategic autonomy, but it's important to bring them in the process. I think the failing, as you hint at, has been on the international economic side. Um, unfortunately, the Biden administration has still uh, represents trade protectionism, um, and I think that's a big handicap for the United States. So while I'm glad that they moved uh, they at least recognize the issue with the, the IPEF uh, proposal. But as one friend said, well, it's rather weak tea and we're not sure when it will be served. And so the question, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting framework, but how would it be filled in? Obviously, it would have been good if the United States had stayed in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I think this will be one of the historical failures. Uh, the politics here don't look good for joining TPP. I hope someday, by the way, that Korea joins TPP as well. Uh, I think it would be yes. good for the Korean system as well. But I think then the challenge will be, and this is one of the things I push, and I hope our allies in the region, which is to urge the administration to keep looking for ways to uh, play a leadership role again on trade and the international economy. Um, yeah. Honestly, I don't see the current U.S. trade representative is doing that, that she doesn't speak in those terms. The Secretary of Commerce, uh, Rolando, has been sort of more positive about it. Um, but importantly, I think even for when I talk with members of Congress, there's a recognition the U.S. is falling behind. So whether it's digital or whether it's some of the other topics, I think this is an area that with good partners such as Korea, we, we need to turn around the present policy. I fully agree with you. And Korea should be important part of the uh, uh, partnership with the United States in those areas. Uh, by the way, the Korean government uh, decided to uh, apply to join CPTPP. Oh, excellent. Yeah. You know, uh, in this connection, in your other contributions and writings in uh, Wall Street Journal and Financial Times and Foreign Affairs, you've been saying that the Americans uh, globalists and the internationalists at heart. Would you elaborate on your point on this? So what's interesting uh, is if one looks at surveys of US public opinion, the percentage of Americans who say that trade is important for the US economy and even for jobs is often in the high 70s. Uh, 
uh, people understand the nature of the of the connection. Um, but I think what's happened is we've had a breakdown in that while the phenomena of globalization remain very strong, the governance of globalization, the rules, the systems, the institutions, those have frayed and have fragmented. And I think in the case of the United States, you do have protectionist constituencies, just as you did uh, in Korea. Um, they're often concentrated in certain political areas. So this is one of the challenges that um, you're starting to see a greater debate on the United States. You're starting to see people recognize if they're worried about inflation, trade barriers are not going to help the problem. So in fact, the administration just finally took some steps to remove some of the barriers for solar panels because they want to expand in, in, uh, in, in the solar area. And then there's the questions about uh, falling behind. And obviously the U.S. is falling behind in East Asia where you're seeing a greater regional pole of, of economic power centered on China. This can't be good for the United States or, or its friends in the region. I think what, what this relates to the broader discussion we're having is there is a recognition in the United States of Chinese economic power. There's a recognition of the importance of the Indo-Pacific. And mm -hmm. if we fall behind economically, we're not going to be serving our strategic interests. Yeah. Yeah. The reason why I mentioned the market access provision uh, in relation with uh, CPTPP is that Korea and U.S., we don't have much problem. We already have uh, uh, chorus FDA. But Southeast Asian countries, for example, you know, the, one of the U.S. Uh, foreign policy objective is to counter uh, Chinese, uh, particularly economic influence in this region. Then Southeast Asian countries are important and this, uh, their access to the U.S. market. I think when President Biden came into office, he had, he had two priorities. Mm -hmm. One was to overcome uh, the pandemic and second, a good economic recovery. Those would be the key to his success. And unfortunately, we've seen some stumbles in both. We talked about the economic recovery in some, I think they overdid the stimulus. And on the pandemic, we've learned that it's something that people are gonna to have to live with over a longer period of time. We're gonna have uh, different variants. And so in addition to vaccinations, you're gonna to have to have sort of ongoing treatment. Um, I thought that the Biden administration's natural approach to foreign policy would be to link its international actions to some of its domestic priorities. And this involves what some scholars call the transnational agenda. So for example, uh, focusing on the climate agreement or focusing on COVID and vaccines internationally. They made some progress on some of these, but I think that's, uh, it, it, it hasn't really carried forward as a success for the president. But I think on the positive side, I think the administration gets generally good marks for its handling of the Russian invasion. The US intelligence uh, was ahead of the curve and people were trying to warn people. So I wrote a piece recently that drew a comparison between um, President Truman in the late 40s and uh, Jimmy Carter in the 70s with Biden. And the similarities were that all three of them faced yeah. uh, inflationary problems. Yeah. All three of them uh, were struggling to hold their party coalition together with pressure from the left. Um, and all three of them faced dramatic international events that they didn't expect. And the question was whether a president can adjust the course. Uh, Truman did, uh, Jimmy Carter didn't. And so I was outlining how I think one of the challenges for President Biden is whether he explains to the American public the changes in the world and how the U.S. policy will also have to change, whether it's our sort of military position and work with allies, uh, whether it's uh, some of the issues about safety and security at home. And then finally, a different type of international leadership dealing with some of the issues that we've talked about today. I think this could be done, but as you know, it's not so easy to make these political changes. So we'll just have to see how that plays out. Yeah, in fact, I really enjoyed reading your column uh, you wrote in uh, Wall Street Journal since uh, 
uh, you headed the World Bank and so-called one of the uh, legacy institutes, institutions along with the IMF and the WTO. And WTO is not really uh, functioning uh, uh, well at all. Since the, their uh, reforms and uh, uh, changes are so difficult, uh, we need uh, informal global governance uh, uh, forums uh, or institutions such as G7 or G20. Uh, in my view, uh, I think G20 is uh, more inclusive and although it's a cumbersome, but it does have successful track records. In fact, uh, I've been advocating, I, I've been uh, suggesting to the Korean government, previous governments, Korea should take ownership. Based on my personal experience, we can do it. Uh, Korea, uh, country like Korea, which is considered uh, middle power country and we can gather like-minded countries and we can exert a collective leadership in, in, in this regard again uh, would you uh, share some of your insights well i think your observations are exactly right in particular let, let's start with a word on korea mm -hmm. uh, korea is both one of the major beneficiaries and success stories of the multilateral system. As you know, in 1950 or 53, the economy of Korea was pretty low on the list. I think you were there, you were below Egypt at the time. Um, right. And here you become one of the top 10 economies in the world. And in addition, you've done it without uh, the natural resources that some countries have, and you see this with a very active uh, technology sector. And I might add something we can talk about a little bit more. There's a soft power dimension of Korea now through your sort of music and uh, and sort of entertainment that is quite popular all around the world, including uh, in the United States. Um, and then, of course, you had the transition to democracy in the 1980s. So this is a tremendous story for the rest of the world, standing in very strong contrast with the DPRK to, to the north. And so, uh, like you, I've always supported the possibility for Korea to build on that record and to help catalyze the actions of, of others. Um, when I was at the World Bank in 2010 and uh, President Lee and you were uh, chairing the G20 summit, I saw this as a very good opportunity for Korea to look beyond the peninsula and, and look to the region and, and globally. And that's what I saw the president uh, trying to do at that time. And this is partly important because in foreign policy, there's often discussions today of the great powers. So United States, China, the EU on economics, uh, Russian military, India. But we also have uh, these transnational issues that I keep alluding to, whether it be biological, economics, uh, climate, or others. And frankly, we're not going to be very successful in dealing with transnational issues unless we can figure out how the powers can work together. But you also, I want to, you mentioned something that I want to draw out, which is that the G20 has the benefit of being inclusive. It has the downside of having a lot of countries, because as you, as you know, in addition to the 20, they invite you know, a few other sort of countries. So it becomes a little unwieldy around the table. And in that context, it's very important that in addition to the United States or the EU, that countries such as Korea um, might be able to prod action if they partner with another country. I think, as I recall, South Korea did some of this with Australia at the time. But, you know, and frankly, if you have countries that do this across from different regions, different stages of development, different experiences, you create a small group. And sometimes that creates an opportunity for the bigger countries to sort of join in in a way where they may not be able to do it in a frontal pattern. And in that context, um, you know, one of the things I've always admired about your institute and the work you've done is that 
you know, without trying to overreach, I think there's an important role for Korea in this. Thank you very much. In fact, uh, I uh, concur with you and uh, Korea is a success story of uh, adopting right system and uh, right strategy. Policies. Now, what's your assessment of the North Korean issue and the uh, Trump and Biden administration's uh, policy for the Korean Peninsula? One reason that I was really delighted to try to be with you today was to build on my sense that Korea is an incredible success story. And over the past 25 years becomes a, a leading economy. Um, you and I were talking before with the benefit of, I think it's Netflix now, I've been watching uh, Korean films with English subtitles. My, my favorite is The Crash Landing on You, and I gather the two stars even got married. Uh, but this is representative of the fact that uh, there's a creative side of, of Korea um, that uh, you see it in the music and, and uh, in other sort of developments and entertainment that also demonstrates something about Korea's sort of wider reach. And we see it in the technology field as well with some of your sort of the advanced companies, whether in you know, the cutting edge with semiconductors or sort of other materials. So at the same time, you've had these successes here at the cockpit of Northeast Asia among even bigger powers. You've got Russia, you've got Japan, you've got China. Yeah. <laughs> and you're the meeting ground of those powers and have been historically, where the US has played a distant role 100 years ago, but more actively over the past 50 or 60 or 70 years. And I can see where that creates a certain defensive psychology in Korea, at the same time, you want to look outward. And I think there's always a challenge for Korean political leadership to strike a balance, which is you're still part of a divided country, and there's a focus on the North, but also whether the degree to which leaders will focus on the regional and global dimensions. And as, as you may know, you know, I was actually the lead US official on German unification in 1989-90. So in the 90s, I met many Koreans talking about prospects for unification. And obviously the circumstances are very different. No one can predict. But I remember suggesting that under any scenario, it was important for the Republic of Korea to have the partnership and trust and confidence of others in the region and globally. So the types of efforts that, that you made with the G20, I think were not only reflecting Korea's accomplishments, but I think they reflect the strategy of Korea and, and its, its future on the peninsula, but as well as regionally and globally. And so I think, you know, today, part of the challenge is for Korea, you know, you have to focus on issues at home, you have to focus on issues of the peninsula, but in the context of the APEC, the G20, you know, the UN, your security alliances. And I believe and always have believed that if, if the Republic of Korea is seen as a contributor in these other contexts, I think you're more likely to get the support on some of the existential issues that Korea faces on the peninsula. This of course brings us to the sensitive issues about relations with Japan, which I know have deep historical roots, but obviously, insofar as Korea and Japan and the US as well as Australia and India and others you know, can develop closer relations, I think that'll be good for everybody. That's obviously an issue only Koreans can deal with. As for the North, um, you and your audience would have more experience with this. I think we always have to have a sense of humanitarian ties when you know, the, the people of North Korea are not the ones that are the cause of this. And so, you know, in terms of their malnutrition or sort of basic needs, I think we all have to be responsible. On the other hand, I think we have to be sensible about deterrence and showing strength because the, the North Korean regime has clearly tried to intimidate uh, South Korea as well as Japan, the United States and others. Um, at the same time, I think um, we need to be cognizant of North Korean tactics and how they try to use these missile tests and others to intimidate. We don't want to overreact, but we also want to keep the door open. 
And in that sense, coming back to President Biden, I think, you know, the United States always needs to respect South Korea's decisions on this and be sensitive to it. And you've got your own politics on these topics. But we, we can be supportive and attentive to because uh, the Northeast Asian region we've seen throughout history is a critical area of security for all of us. And with South Korea's success, fortunately, it's also now become an economic engine for the world. But it's vitally important, and this is where I think your symposium plays a key role, to keep looking outward and see how Korea can contribute, but it can also become a partner and draw in people from the United States and the region uh, to be your partners and friends. Thank you very much. Uh, Bob Zelik, as a friend of Koreans, your advice is uh, well taken. By the way, uh, very recently, uh, President Biden and our newly elected uh, President Yoon had a very successful summit. The two nations uh, existing uh, security and military uh, alliance was strengthened and uh, upgraded. Well, with this, I think we can go on, but uh, we should end our formal conversation here. Thank you very much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, and I'm really glad yeah. I had a chance to speak okay. to your audience.